my group is the only group in the European Parliament to have fully committed to a fully-fledged campaign on the issue of LGBT rights. Today, three out of five uh, countries, or three out of the five countries who have legalized same-sex marriage are in Europe. That is encouraging. But in many areas, public policy has not yet caught up with public opinion. This cause of fundamental rights so that we can guarantee, most particularly to the more vulnerable groups uh, uh, and more threatened groups of society who need more protection, rights and liberties uh, which will be more solidly founded, recognised and defended. This is about human rights, the rights of every individual European citizen to lead their lives as they uh, as they wish. Um, and I think that is very much the cornerstone of European integration. I think this is what the whole U European integration isn't about the single market. It started after the Second World War because we said never again. Never again will people be prosecuted. Never again um, will people have to fear for their lives because of who they are. Is let's make sure that we go beyond the party political divisions. This is not about a, a propaganda exercise for us as individuals uh, with our own hobby horses. We're here today as uh, uh, politicians, experts, people who experience this reality day after day. I would dare to say that Vladimir uh, uh, Spidla is at least one of, one of the most gay-friendly commissioners uh, you've ever had. He is a person who's who finds homophobic prejudice particularly distasteful and particularly uh, unacceptable. Not that other prejudices would be acceptable, but of course there are many types of prejudice, inter-ethnic prejudice, which have a lot of history of conflict and competition. Uh, lesbian and gay, bisexual and transgender rights are human rights. They are not separable uh, from the main body of human rights. And to go down that route, to go down what I would call the notion of a separate directive route and selective defense of human rights is to repeat uh, the appalling atrocities that led to the Second World War. The, the biggest issue around the, this, this campaign and this proposal around another anti-discrimination directive, there are about five points, I suppose, that we would like to make on it. And one is that we understand that LGBT people are within every community. So they are older, they are younger, they are in different religions, they have disabilities, they are of different races, they are of different ethnic origins. As with anybody who is older, they are in all the other communities. Uh, the trend in some member states um, is towards um, a single piece of equality or anti-discrimination legislation treating all grounds in essentially the same way. Um, the UK is finally heading in that direction. Um, the Netherlands has a single law. A number of member states do. And um, I think the same should be happening at the European Union level. My proposal, which I will um, write up and circulate as soon as possible, at least to try and get a debate going, is for a single equality directive um, based on a single legal basis. So in July 2005, we approved a, a law on homosexual marriage. Um, that was opposed by the uh, People's Party and uh, two members uh, from the Christian Democrat group in uh, Catalonia. So it means that most of the parties, therefore, representing the Spanish people, uh, coming from different political shades, did approve that law. In year 2000, we adopted an anti-discrimination uh, legislation on multi-grounds, and so sexual orientation was there. So sexual orientation discrimination based on sexual orientation was forbidden on everything, services, employment, whatever. At the same time, the criminal code criminalizing the sexual activity was still in force. So these organizations uh, 
act very democratic here, but in Moscow, the uh, official representative of the Pope uh, joins with the Russian Orthodox Church preaching against basic democratic rights, then we mustn't accept that. And how police deal with, uh, behave uh, during such event uh, to ensure that uh, the police maintain its neutrality and law enforcement role. As we heard from uh, uh, Folke's statements, in some countries uh, it, it still remain an issue. For example, uh, last year there was a, a statement by some police um, individuals within the Latvian forces who were uh, trying to initiate boycotting, protecting the game march. So it's remained, uh, we need to be vigilant about how the states and police are going to act. Sadly, it has also been necessary for us to highlight these rights and violations of these rights within the EU. The fact that in 2008, the right to freedom of assembly and the freedom of expression are not available to everyone in the European Union is a sad and slightly surreal reality. The denial of the right to peaceful assembly to certain LGBT communities in the EU, or to any other community for that matter, within the EU is an insult to the concept of civil rights in the EU. Last year we organized a big study visit to the Netherlands during the Dutch Gay Pride. Um, I was very cautious about this study visit because I know what the Dutch Amsterdam Pride looks like. It's very overwhelming, in particular for people that come from very disadvantaged societies. Um, so I was very curious to see how this was going to impact on the activists that we invited. Mm, and actually the impact was very good. It was a very, very empowering uh, effect for, for those people. I heard some arguments, I'm mainly dealing with economic issues, that this is also dangerous for the economic development in Europe. I agree, I agree. But for me it's uh, uh, firstly an individual, a human rights. But of course if that could perhaps uh, uh, give some extra argument for for those that actually doubt, uh, we can also give them economical arguments. The EU cannot disregard the profound changes of the family patterns in the last decades. A legal system does not acknowledge these uh, changes and accommodates them is doomed to fail to effectively regulate the life of society in the long term. One is the Morocco judgment, which I will not address because will be the object of um, uh, the next session, I suppose. But it's very important and I will touch upon briefly. And the other is a um, very important decision in the European Court of Human Rights concerning adoption by single um, people. A number of member states have been quite sort of cooperative. Um, not that they shouldn't be, but um, it's not always the case. And so when we've pointed out areas which we think are problematic, even at the very beginning stage of an infringement procedure, um, the legislation has been amended and the problem uh, resolved. We, of course, are calling for a new anti-discrimination uh, directive that would extend the protection and, and go beyond the, the good directives that were adopted in 2000. There was a significant progress already. We have had just in the last few weeks two very relevant cases which I think highlight very clearly some of the important positive potential of the EU legal framework on asylum for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people, but also some of its shortcomings, particularly in regard to current member state practice. To, have, to allow two members of the Cuban volleyball team to escape from Bulgaria, enter overnight Italy and in two days get political asylum, which is something unheard of, but it happened uh, last uh, spring. What was very interesting is how we, we were able to convince those of our colleagues who initially were reluctant to uh, change the law in, 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 in such a way. And it, it, we did it by, by returning the argument of discrimination. Egypt, and I remember it's now quite a few years ago, uh, with Michael Cashman as the chair of the intergroup, um, we actually had the Egyptian ambassador uh, to talk with us. Um, Octavia is nodding, you may remember that, because there were infamous cases of the persecution of, uh, yes, of gay men on a, on a boat.